I've been doing .NET for a long time. <laughs> like every day of my life. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, go ahead. Who left? <laughs> Who left? Oh, I left? Oh. Uh, not exactly. So, um, so you're asking about my story? <laughs> um, I can share with you my story. Um, I became a full-time Microsoft, uh, Microsoft employee three and a half years ago. I was never a full-time Microsoft employee prior to that. So what happened was, um, I mean, I'll give you my, my whole biography, but like as fast as possible, <laughs> okay? So um, I graduated with a computer science degree. I got a full-time job working at an optical character recognition company. Anybody know what OCR is? Optical character recognition? Yes, that's it? Just one guy? Two people? Three people? <sighs> well, it's a horrible job. <laughs> um, what the company did was they would take pieces of paper, like from a magazine or something that has words on it, you run it through a scanner, and then optical character recognition would look at the scans and would convert it back into digital form. My first job, I was responsible for the uppercase AE ligature pair that's like used in the Netherlands or something. So, um, and then maybe a few other places. So I worked on recognizing that character, the uppercase one, mind you, not the lowercase one. <laughs> that was reserved for somebody else with more special skills than what I had fresh out of college. So I did the uppercase AE literature for three months. I stared at that character. And I remember very clearly, at the end of the three months, I walked up to my manager and I said, I did it as best I could. I cannot make it any better. And he said to me, great, we're going to put you on the British pound sign now. <laughs> and I said, I quit. And I just quit. I couldn't take it anymore. So, um, so I quit that job. It took me one month exactly to find a job somewhere else. And um, I worked at this company. We were building CD-ROM software. So at the building the CD-ROM software, this was back in the DOS days. So we're like 1988, 1989 is the time frame for this. And, um, and that was a much better job. I can't remember how long I was there. Maybe two years, three years, something like that. Uh, anyway, Windows 3 had come out in beta. And it was getting a lot of press. Um, that it had broken these memory boundaries, and it was so easy to write code for, and everything was awesome about it. So I went to my manager at the new company, and they said, I said, can I get us on the beta list, and we can start, I want to start learning Windows, and I want to write our program in Windows 3. And he said yes. And so I got us on the list, and it came out, and then I really learned Windows. I said, this is the future. It's going to change the world. It's going to be awesome. And I really threw myself into it. Um, then I thought Windows was missing a feature that would be really nice if it had, and so I wrote this utility that ran on top of it. And I thought other people, like yourselves, would be interested in this, so I decided to write a magazine article to explain to developers this utility that I wrote and how I made it work. And I sent that to a magazine. And uh, the magazine never published it, by the way. <laughs> but the magazine was published by a book publisher. And the book publisher said to the magazine people, we hear this Windows 3 is going to be awesome. It's in the news all the time. Do you guys at the magazine know anybody who could write a book on Windows? And the magazine guy said, well, we just got this article from this guy Jeff Richter yesterday. We don't know him, but call him. So they called me on the phone and they said, hey, would you want to write a book on Windows? And, uh, and I said, wow, I'd never written a book before. It was very scary to me. And I said, what do I have to lose? So um, we negotiated a contract, um, and I'm happy to share with you numbers if you want. Um, they paid me $3,000 up front, $3,000 upon completion. So it was a total of $6,000. And, uh, and then I got somewhere between 10 and 15% royalties on the, on the book. And uh, the money you get up front is considered an advance towards royalties. So the publisher has to make that $6,000 back before I see any more money at all. Um, and I said to them, and so if I take the 3000 up front and I don't write the book, I don't finish it, then what happens? And they said, well, you'll have to refund the $3,000 back, which tip, no publisher will ever ask for you for that back. 
So I have a friend who went to a publisher and said, hey, I'd like to write a book, and they gave him an advance, and then he never wrote the book. And he just kept the money. Then about a year later, he went to another publisher and said, hey, I'd like to write a book for you, and they gave him an advance, and he just kept the money. He did that like three or four times, and now nobody will hire him. But, but for a while there, it was, it's a business model, if you will. Um, anyway, um, I did write the book. I did lose a girlfriend while writing the book. <laughs> <clears throat> so, so there, you know, there's some good and there's some bad. Um, then I got asked to speak at conferences, because conferences like it when book authors come. They think people have read the book and then you'll come. What do you think? Does that work? <laughs> right, so it seems to work even today to some de degree. So I got asked to speak at conferences and conferences would pay uh, really well. And then people at conferences would say, hey, back at my company, We've, our company has sent two developers to this conference, but back at the company, we have 20 developers. So would you come to our company and consult and uh, teach our, all of our developers at the company? And I said yes, and that paid really well. So, um, so then I quit my full-time job at the other company where we did the CD-ROM software, and now I was a full-time consultant. And I was going to companies and I was training them, on, their developers, on Windows and C and C++, and I was speaking at conferences, and that's really what I did. Then I found other people just like me, and we decided to form our own company. So we created a company called Wintelect, and it was 18 years ago when we created that company. And so now we had a bunch of us that were going to conferences and doing consulting work, and we made a real company out of it, and I was there for many years, 15 years or so. About three and a half years ago, and that's what I'd been doing. So that had me traveling all over the world. I've been to China many times, India many times, Europe many times, but this is my first time in Russia. <laughs> um, and that was great. I got a lot of traveling in. I met a lot of great people. I did a lot of fun things. It was an awesome time in my life. I got paid very well. Yeah, I like that too. As a bonus, that was great. Um, but then I got married, and then I had kids, and then I noticed I was on the road all the time, and I was missing all my kids' activities. Um, piano recitals, soccer games, jump rope, all kinds of trampoline competitions, and things like that. Um, we're almost there, just hanging a little bit longer. <laughs> almost there, I'm giving you my life story in a real short period of time. Um, and so three and a half years ago, I said, it's too much. I'm doing way too much traveling, plus, I meet great people when I travel, but then when I leave, I don't have any friends when I come back home. So I decided to get a full-time job at Microsoft three and a half years ago. I travel a lot less, and I work with the same people every day, and now we go to lunch together, and we go to see movies together, and we do other fun things together, out to dinner and shows and things like that. Uh, and then two months ago, I sold my ownership in Wintelect, so I no longer own it. Um, I sold it to the other guys. The company's still there. It's still being very successful, and I wish them the best of luck. We got along great. Um, everything ended very amicably. Um, I'm happy with the amount of money I got at the end and all of that. And now I'm at Microsoft and uh, doing work there. And I travel a lot less, but I'm very happy to be here today. <laughs> okay. So. Right, so as part of my consulting work, I did a lot of consulting at Microsoft. So, because I moved, so one guy I met at a conference, um, he said he wanted to start a software utility company in Bellevue, Washington, which is, you know, Microsoft's in Redmond, Washington, so the two cities are right next to each other. So they're very close. And uh, he asked me if I would move, I, I was born and raised in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, which is the east coast of the United States. He asked me at a conference, would I move to the west coast in Bellevue and start this company with him? And I said, yes, I'll do that. And so I did move out there and start that company with him. Six months in, we disagreed on everything. <laughs> Um, he was all about form, I was all about function. He's like, I do not want to have a button on that screen that's confusing to users, they won't know what to do. And I would be, if we don't put a button there, the program doesn't do anything. You can't click it and have it actually do something. And we would fight about this kind of thing relentlessly. At the end of the six months, we're like, we're just not going to see eye to eye, it's not going to come together. And so um, I left him um, to go on his own. And then I was looking for other work to do consulting. So I started consulting at Microsoft. So I worked on the Windows Sound System team for quite some time. 
couple years maybe. I worked on Visual Studio, the first 32-bit version of Visual Studio. Uh, Codename Barracuda, I worked on that for, I don't know, a couple of years. I did stuff in Windows and accessibility, the, ma the first magnifier app, the run as utility, I wrote that. <laughs> um, for NT4 uh, was the first version I wrote it for. Um, and then I did stuff with the tablet PC for a while there, and I would do consulting for other companies too. Microsoft was just one of my customers that I was doing consulting with. Uh, and then the .NET team actually approached me. I knew people on .NET, and they came to me, and they said, you work a lot with customers and consultants. We're building this new platform. Would you come and learn about it? They were doing an internal conference for two days. It was invite only, and they invited me. So they went through this new C-sharp programming language. It wasn't called C-sharp at the time. And they started showing, you know, all garbage collection and all this different stuff that you could do with it. And I said, oh, this is going to change the world. It's going to be incredible. I was C and C++ programmer up to that point. So then they said, well, if you really think it's that interesting, why don't you consult on the common language runtime team? Um, and so I said yes, and so I, would, I had an office in Building 42, and I used to go in every day when I wasn't traveling and teaching or speaking at conferences, and I would go in there and I would work on .NET. Um, I did iDisposable. I'm not, it's not my proudest work, mind you, but I'm kind of the creator of iDisposable and a few other things that are in there or things that I had done. And then I started working on the .NET book at that time, which was the most painful book that I had worked on. And what made it so hard was that while they were building the platform, I was writing the first version of the book. And I was helping them. And whenever I was writing something in the book and I said, you know what, this is stupid. Um, this could be done better. Um, I would go, I could now go to the team and I could say, we should improve this before we ship it. And a lot of times they would say, yes, you're right, we should do it. And we would fix it. The team would go and fix it. But that meant I had to rewrite what I wrote in the book. <laughs> so I end up writing a lot of things and then giving feedback, then they would change it and then I would have to rewrite it. And that happened a lot. And it took many, many more months than I thought to write that first edition of the book. Um, because it was a V1 product, it hadn't shipped yet, there was no backward compatibility, so they just could change anything. Writing the version two, you know, the second, third, fourth editions of the book was much, much simpler because strings work the way they work. <laughs> Interfaces work the way they work, things work the way they work, and there was much less that they could do. So that's, uh, that's my story there. <laughs> Yes. Um so they're copying a feature that's in Java as is true with a lot of things in C-sharp and .NET, <laughs> or copying things that were done in other languages, with Java being a big one, of course, but some other languages too. It improves a lot of the, it gives you the ability to version an interface, which is a really nice feature to have. So, um, so it's been in Java for a long time. So in general, I haven't heard people complain about this feature in Java being there. And it does enable the ability to version interface in, future, in the future, which would be a nice thing to have. I've run into that on the Service Fabric team. Um, we did a lot of things that were interface-based, and we were always adding features where we wanted to add a new method to the interface. And because you're not supposed to do that, we couldn't do that. But this feature would allow us to do that. So it enables a bunch of things that would be really nice to have. So yes, it's, you know, there's some practicalities of life that sometimes get in the way of the purity of something. Um, when extension methods first came out, I hated them. Uh, I thought, this is an abomination. How can this guy over here add a method to the class written by this guy over here? <laughs> Right? It's not supposed to work like that. I don't know what it means to do that. Um, but then after I used them for a while, I started to see, wow, this really increases my productivity. It allows me to create these flowing lines of code where I have this great amount of composability. And I really enjoyed that a lot. And so I started to like them quite a bit. 
for the record, I've now come to not like them as much anymore <laughs> because when I look at code, I don't know what's happening anymore. Is this a method on the class or is this a, like even the as span example, right? Somebody said, so does string have as span? I don't know, right? Let's go look. Oh, it turns out it's an extension method, <laughs> right? It's not on string. So I don't like that uncertainty. I never liked properties. I always thought properties were a bad idea. And the reason is because you can't look at the code and if it, it looks like a field, a property looks like a field, and you don't know, is it a field or is it a property? And fields are state, and properties, which are methods, are behavior. So when you look at something, you can't tell if you're just getting or setting state or if behavior. And the prime example of the screw up is date time now, right? Now is a property. And every time you call it, it's supposed, it looks like it's returning you state, but it returns a different value every time you call it. <laughs> That's not how fields are supposed to work, right? Plus, you can't pass properties by reference, but you can pass fields by reference. There's, there's places where it just falls apart and it breaks down. So it's a leaky abstraction. So I never liked them. And uh, I wish they weren't in the platform. So I'm, I'm kind of anti-property and I'm I borderline with extension methods. I haven't used this interface thing yet enough to know and get a good sense of it. But I think it has a practical purpose. But it is a little bit less pure. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I say now it takes that interview question away from you. So ask a span question now. <laughs> right? Yeah, I don't think there's any shortage of potential interview questions that you can ask um, for C Sharp and .NET related things, right? There's a ton of stuff, exception handling, garbage collection related. There's other stuff interface related you can ask, lambdas. There's a ton of stuff. Um, so let's not worry about that one. Yeah, right? So, yeah, there's, there's no shortage of interview questions that are available. <laughs> Let's not worry about the abstract base class versus interface one. Yes? Yes. <laughs> so, just for the record, I am not part of the .NET Framework team at Microsoft. I'm on Azure. So um, my answer should not be construed as a formal statement from the .NET team at Microsoft. <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll preface it with that disclaimer. In general, do you think this? Uh, I don't know. Good <laughs> <laughs> okay. Does yes. Where would I use span of memory in a standard what kind of application? Yeah, yeah, where you can recommend I mean, uh, well, certainly any kind of string formatting or string parsing, span will give you greater efficiency. There's no question. Well, so, okay, so you're saying, let's say you got a JSON payload or XML payload, you're going to deserialize that into the object. And so you wouldn't be using the span directly then. It's true, but the code that does, the code in the framework that does serialization and deserialization, it is very likely to use span under the covers in the future to give you improved performance, right? Um, I know that Kestrel is using span very heavily now. So all the HTTP communication that happens with Kestrel is all using span underneath the covers. And they've gotten enormous efficiency and performance improvements by doing that. So you yourself may not be using span, but you are using something that uses span. Okay. okay. Anything else you'd like to chat about? Where? Where are you? Oh, yeah, there you are.
other languages are too complex and too, uh, too rich with uh, syntax sugar, and it's really too, it's really hard to 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 find the starting point where to start the program. What do you think about this? Well, let me ask you a question back before I answer that. Do you think that the managed languages with all this richness is harder than native languages? Yeah, but that's what I'm referring to. Yeah. The more features uh, added to them, and I think uh, finding a starting point, what you what need to know to start to write something. Yes. Uh, it's uh, really hard. So I completely agree with you. And I do think that the languages are adding all kinds of crazy abstractions over time. Um, I used to teach classes on language integrated query and how it worked under the cover so people could debug it and understand performance and memory consumption of it. And usually at the end of the hour or two presentation, pe people's heads were had exploded and I had to clean the blood up off the walls. It, was, it would keep me there for hours. Um, so, I mean, for people to get started, I think you have to keep it simple. So I think, you know, what's a class, what's a method, um, what are fields, you know, how to derive off of that, virtual methods. I mean, the core object-oriented programming concepts are data encapsulation, uh, inheritance, and polymorphism, right? Those, those still are the key core three things that every developer who's working in an object-oriented language must know those things, right? In .NET, this async await thing has become very popular, and I think you have to know it at this point um, because there's too many other things like HTTP client which it, a lot of people are making HTTP requests nowadays when you build these distributed applications it only has async methods there are no synchronous methods so I think you have to know how the async await stuff works so, um, lambdas I think you can largely use them without fully understanding them um, when it doesn't work you're in trouble <laughs> but as long as it works you're okay right Language integrated query, I wouldn't even try. I mean, you, you should be, have good foundation in all these other things that I said before you would even try language integrated query. And language integrated query, I mean, I'm, I'm down on it now too. The performance overhead, the memory consumption overhead is not good. Um, it does give you this nice composability and it's supposed to be the code is easier to read but I don't think the code is necessarily easier to write. In fact, what happened for me, you can tell me if this is true for you, a lot of times I would write a link expression in my source code, I would compile it, I would run it, it wouldn't work. And I don't know why it wouldn't work. So you could put breakpoints at some of the lines, but that's very painful to debug, right? You can't really put, if you could put a try catch around the whole thing, but the catch doesn't catch it until you execute it, right? So exception handling doesn't work right, right? So then what I always did was I would take the line of code that I thought was most complex, I would copy it out of the link expression, and I would debug it in the small, right? I would just write a separate, and I would get it debug and working. Then when I had it corrected, I would move it back into the link expression, which, by the way, fully invalidates the whole purpose of language integrated query when you do that, right? It was supposed to be easy to read, write, and maintain the code. That's its main benefit. And it had lost it, unless for simple things, it had lost it. So I would definitely postpone language integrated query. Um, I know people use properties a lot in .NET. I think, I don't know why. <laughs> I just don't know why. But, I mean, so there are certain things that need it, like designers, right? That's useful for designers, drag and drop on a Windows form or WPF app. They use properties for a lot of things. Um, it's a shame, I think, that the designer was designed that way. I think there's other ways a designer could have been designed, but they use properties. I'm not a big fan of properties, so I would even discourage use of that as much as you could. 
Um, those are, I think, the, I mean, then obviously the core constructs, if loops, while loop, do, you know, switch case, obviously those things. Um, you have to know those. And I think those are the core things. And then you can be very productive and you can write a lot of code with that. Um, that's what I would do in C Sharp. Yes. What if, kind of, taking a language and learn it, uh, so can you do that to be like, it's not the goal for you to be a professional developer in the English language, I assume, or? Well, it's always a goal for me yeah. <laughs> to keep my skill set, right? Can you reach that? So how do you approach that? Okay, so first of all, what I find, um, uh, it's been very interesting for me to get this job at Microsoft. Um, and there's been some real pain points for me. So I had my own company for, well, Wintelect 18 years, but I was consulting and teaching even years before that. So for several decades, I had been working for myself. Then I get this full-time job at Microsoft. There was some several rude awakenings that happened to me when I was there. Um, first thing I noticed was that if I take a day off of work or a week, I still get paid. That paycheck goes into my bank account every two weeks, no matter what. It always is there. And I can goof off. I can do serious stuff. Um, now, I would work hard because it's kind of in my nature. I think it's just who I am. And then I started working with these other people, though, and realizing it's not who they are. <laughs> And a lot of them came fresh out of college, got this job, and they just get paid. Whether they do anything or not, they just get paid. <laughs> and it's very surprising to me about that. So uh, the other thing that I noted, to get back to your question, was that I'm always interested in improving myself. I'm not there for Microsoft. Um, like my entire career, I am there for me. And what can I do for me? I'm at Microsoft today, I might be at Google tomorrow, I might be at Amazon the next day, I might be at Facebook after that, probably not Facebook, but, <laughs> but you never know, maybe, and, um, and you never know, right? I never know where I'm going to go in life, and people move all the time, that's another thing I noticed. People were at Microsoft, they quit, they go to Amazon, they're there for a year, then they come back. I had a friend who went to Google for a year, and um, Oracle, for a year and a half, and then he came back to Microsoft. So. I am always focused on what is best for me. And obviously, the company, Microsoft, needs to get some value out of me being there, too. So on the Azure storage team, um, I was charged with re-architecting the SDKs, and we build SDKs in a lot of different languages. So I uh, am learning Python. Um, the first language I learned was Go. And, and I've got to tell you, I love it. Um, Go has a lot of really positive things about it, Google's Go language. And uh, it has some things, it also has some problems. Um, there's, every, people say there's only two kinds of languages in the world, those that people complain about and those that no one uses. So Go is, um, its error handling in particular, I think is um, really problematic and needs some improvement upon, but they are working on it. It doesn't have generics, another common complaint, but they're trying to work on generics. It didn't have a good versioning story, but they just added that in the most recent version. So Google is actively working on Go, and there's a lot of real positive things about Go. So I consider myself at this point to be somewhat of a Go expert. I've even spoken at Go conferences now, and it's a little bit outside the Microsoft world, which makes me more employable by, let's say, a Google or an Amazon. <laughs> so uh, I really like that. And then I've been doing TypeScript in Node because we have to build our SDKs in that. And um, I've done more Java now because we build our SDKs at that. And we're re rebuilding the .NET SDK and we want to use Span in that. So I've been keeping up with the C Sharp and .NET side of the world. And then soon, but not yet, we're going to start a break ground on the Python SDK and I'll be learning some Python, which I really know almost nothing about right now but I will learn that. Um, and I just look at all of these things as making me better, making me more valuable, making to a company and that would be willing to pay more for my services too, and keeping me relevant. And so that's what I always do. I'm always focused on me, and the fact that Microsoft can get some benefit out of me doing this stuff is good. They're happy that I'm here. Microsoft also likes it when I go and I speak at things like this on C Sharp, and when I do that, um, video serials and architecting distributed cloud applications. They're very happy that I did that. 
Um, but I just chose to do that myself. Nobody asked me. I said, look, I see a need. There's a problem. People don't seem to understand these things. I think I can explain it. So I went and built this course, and then I put it up there, and then I tell my managers later, or they find out about it by accident uh, in some cases. Um, but they're generally happy about this sort of thing because they want people to learn more so they can find value in Microsoft's technologies. So all this stuff is good, and I think it's what you should focus on too, I think, um, is you know, yourself. And focus on what makes yourself better first, but it does have to have some synergy with what the company is paying you to do if you're working at a company. And I work with a lot of people who do not think that way. <laughs> they're like, just there, nine to five job, not passionate, this is what they're doing now. If they ever, they work on some weird obscure thing and they find it very hard to get a job someplace else later because they worked on some weird obscure thing that a lot of other companies don't need. Um, it's not a good place for them to be. That was a long answer. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. It's all a mix. <laughs> it's all a mix. So I'll sit on airplanes and I'll certainly read technical stuff. I'll download videos and I'll watch videos on programming languages. Um, it's mostly what I do. I'm either entertaining myself or that. I don't have very much in the way of hobbies. Um, really, my computers has always been my hobby. So it's been the thing that I love and therefore I do more of it. Fortunately, it's been rewarding. Um, financially as well as otherwise. So I do a lot of it. Um, I do a lot of it. But you know, you get married, you have kids, so you gotta spend some time with the wife, right? And you have to spend some time with the kids. Um, and now I'm older, I'm getting closer to retirement, so I think more about you know, what the future holds for me. So what I, what I think um, for retirement, um, to fully retire I think would drive me crazy. To do nothing all day, every day, I do not think I could handle it. I would be a basket case. It would just be awful. And then I saw Cars 3. Have you seen the movie Cars 3? Yeah? Changed my life. <laughs> Changed my life. Um, if you haven't seen it, I'm going to spoil it a little bit. <laughs> okay, but it's been out a couple years now. You should have seen it. If you're not going to see it, if you haven't seen it, you're not going to see it. So Cars 3, Lightning McQueen, you know, he was the top of his game, big racing car, and now he's old, like me, <laughs> right? And so uh, the coach is trying to get him to be a good car racer again, but he's really struggling to be a good car racer, and eventually he comes to the conclusion he can't do it. So the coach becomes the racer, and he becomes the coach, right? And now he's finding value in his life by teaching other people to be the experts. And when I saw that movie, I walked out and I said, that's my retirement. That's what I'm going to do, exactly. It was really enlightening for me. So when I retire, I think I'm going to get a job at a college or university, and I'm going to teach programming or cloud applications, distributed systems, something like that. Um, I have all this knowledge and experience, I feel like, to just stop <laughs> passing it on to other people would be a big waste, and it would give me something to do. So that's, so I think even to my death, I think I'm going to be doing this. <laughs> that's my plan, is to do this until I die in some way. But I love it, so it's been good for me. Yes? What helps me to keep on focus is I have to do things with my wife, I have to do things with the kids, <laughs> right? There are certain immovable objects, <laughs> right, or periods of time. You know, I have to get permission to come here, right? Ask the family, you know, and you know, this is Thanksgiving this week in the States, which is a pretty big holiday for us. And the conference is on Thursday, it's the exact same day as Thanksgiving, and we always have Thanksgiving dinner together. Um, but I went to the family, and, I don't know how much personal information you want. I seem to be sharing quite a bit of it, but <laughs> um, in April, this past April, I broke my leg in a motorcycle accident. And so I was laying in bed for quite some time, and I was on crutches and a wheelchair and things like that, and I said to myself, is this my life? Am I going to wake up every day and go to work, <laughs> and then I'm going to come home, have dinner? Where, and my wife's always, what do you want to have dinner tonight? I'm like, I don't know. I mean, we've been having dinner together for decades now. It's, it's either this chicken thing, this meat thing, a pizza maybe. It's, <laughs> right? There's only so many options, and we just seem to repeat them constantly over and over again. 
So then I got the invitation to come out here to speak at this conference, and I said, you know, I've never been to Russia. Let's do it. So I went to the family and said, but I'll miss Thanksgiving because it was planned at the same time. And they're like, that's fine. Go ahead. And so I came out. So um, I am trying now to pepper my life with unusual things, the periodic unusual things. So I, I went to an investor's conference. I also do money management um, to you know, do some investing with my money and things like that. So there was an investor's conference in Las Vegas. I went to that about a month ago with a friend of mine. And uh, we had a blast. And my wife and I went to Salt Lake City to look at colleges for my kids. We took my sons with us too. Um, in February, I'm going to go on a rock and roll cruise ship in the Caribbean with my brother. Um, so I am a, a fan of music. I will travel the world to go see certain music groups I like perform in concert. So that's maybe the one hobby that I have is doing that. And so I kind of get those things in for a pleasure in my life. Other than that, it's family time or it is learning something new typically or writing, building some piece of code or something that's going to ship. That's pretty much my life. Oh, sounds sad to me like that. It's like five things is what I do. I eat dinner. <laughs> you know, that's about it. But it's, it's been good. It's good. Anything else? Yes. Like collaboration on a book or something? Uh, on some of my books, I do have co-authors. And that has been hit or miss. Sometimes it's worked out well, sometimes it hasn't worked out too well. I've rewritten some chapters or they didn't deliver on a timely fashion, but what they wrote was good quality. So there's that. I mean, obviously at Microsoft, I collaborate on a whole team. It's not just me doing this work um, in Azure Storage or on Service Fabric. I mean, Service Fabric had, I don't know, 100 plus people that I would interact with on a regular basis. Um, on the Azure storage team, we had this engineering team. I was the architect, but I would be working with the Java guy and the Python guy and the Node guy to build out the SDK. And they would say, well, we have this issue. We would understand the language, learn how to fix it better. And it was very collaborative there. So that's one of the reasons why I took this full-time job is because I wanted to do more collaborative work and then make friends and relationships out of it, which when I was at Wintelect, it was not as much collaboration that went on there. Um, Wintelec was a very virtual company. I lived in Seattle. Everybody else lived in other parts of the United States. We almost never saw each other except when we went to a conference to speak. We had phone calls all the time. We were always on the phone and conference calls, but those were maybe an hour, and there wasn't a lot of collaboration that went on. And I love collaboration, and I miss it and, um, when I didn't have it. But now I'm at Microsoft and I have it, so that's been really good for me. You know? But I don't know about working on a book or something. Question? Question? Anybody? Anything? No? Okay. We're all done? Yeah. Okay. All right. Then we'll call it the good. Well, thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> okay. Thank you.